Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome to another episode of Science Save Sharks. My name is Dickie Chivel, and joining me today is the very talented Miss Kelly Baker. How are you, Kelly? Hi, Dickie. I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. I'm still a bit covered in oil, guys. <laughs> As you guys can see, um, I was taking a drum of oil out of that was floating in the ocean a bit earlier today on one of our guided walks. But other than that, I'm doing very well, thanks. Good so, to hear. <laughs> thanks. Um, so, Kelly, thanks for joining. And, guys, thank you very much for joining. For those of you that are new to the show, um, we are from a company called Marine Dynamics, and we do shark cage diving and whale watching in the Khan Spa area, which is situated about two hours away from Cape Town. Uh, but we also do various conservation projects and research projects, um, some of that on great white sharks, which brings Miss Kelly Baker in. Kelly, so cool. Always, always excited to have a chat. So we're going to chat to, to Kelly at today, guys. Uh, we're going to chat to Kelly about um, super fish, great white sharks, how they heal, and the healing processes on extensive wounds that, they, that occur on these sharks. So, Kelly, um, firstly, I'm going to bring it, I'm going to bring in um, the fact that Hey, Kareem, thank you very much for watching. Mm -hmm. I'm going to bring in the fact that obviously these sharks are getting these injuries through natural and unnatural ways. So can you first, let's let's start by leading in, to, in with that. Yeah, well, I, I think uh, it's something that really doesn't uh, come into people's minds when you're talking about sharks. We tend to, to think of sharks as the one giving out the damage, but they too, too can get injured. So you're right, there are a, a number of things that could actually cause damage to, to a shark, both natural and let's say anthropogenic in, in origin. So let's touch on the, the natural side of things. Um, so we would be talking about interspecies and intraspecies um, interactions there. Um, so in regards to your interspecies interactions, um, we're, we're talking about um, interactions between two or more different species. So for our great white sharks, um, a, a nice example there would be them, say, hunting a cape fur seal in, in this area. Um, you know, an unwilling meal, of course, they're going to put up a, a bit of a fight for their survival. And it's not uncommon for us to see injuries inflicted uh, by the prey on the predator and our cape fur seals are more than capable of causing a few bites or scratches on our shark. So that would be one of the natural ways that these injuries could occur with our great whites. Yeah, 100% Kelly. I mean, um, you and I have both seen these scratches on the great whites. And remember, guys, um, it's when hunting a cape fur seals, Kelly, you said something very interesting um, earlier when me and you had a quick chat bef before this live session and that was that these animals are not willingly getting eaten by a mm. shark. So if you're looking at a, a bull cape fur seal, guys, you're looking at a 350 kilogram animal with canines. I mean, through disentanglements, when, when disentangling bull seals, I've had one but a hole straight through my arm before, like Honestly, I could see through <laughs> through my whole arm. So you're looking at formidable animals that these sharks are hunting to begin with. Yeah, you mentioned 350 kilograms. They're, they're large animals, those bull cape. Okay, guys. <laughs> All good? Kelly. <laughs> oh, Kelly, are you there? Are you, I, are you I am here. Out of me? <laughs> okay, cool. But yeah, some of those Cape fur seals are actually larger than our, our great white shark. So more than capable of inflicting a little bit of damage there. Yeah. Um, and then, so guys, we're looking at, obviously, these are natural ways for the, for the shark to attain these injuries. So we're looking at interspecies, 
which would be the sharks with the seals. But Kelly, I remember you mentioning intra species as well. And what does that mean? And where are we going with that? Yeah, so that sort of interaction would be between individuals of the same species. So an example for our great white sharks, say a great white shark biting another great white shark, okay? Um, so that uh, a lot of times there's a that competition coming into play. So competition for um, resources, um, areas, the, the food sources perhaps, and that uh, could quite easily turn to, to biting each other. So that could be aggression or even, even mating amongst these sharks. So another way that we um could see these sharks um sustaining injuries yeah 100 percent. so kelly you and i have both seen it around the the cage diving vessels and when working with with great white sharks is so guys um you're looking at two different things mating which is really really cool and if you capture it on film please let us know because no one's ever filmed great white sharks mating before but taking it from studies from other sharks the male will bite onto the side of the female latching on and then insert one of its claspers um, but something that we also um see around the boats is the hierarchy when it comes to sharks and this is what something else that makes working with sharks so cool is the fact that each of them have their own personality they've got their own unique personality so usually there's a hierarchy in size when going for instance the bait line at the boat so usually the smaller sharks will give way to the bigger shark um at the boat and but no actually but when you're looking at personalities when it comes to individuals you'll get these smaller sharks that actually say no dude i'm going for that bait first so they they disregard the hierarchical order of size and the personality comes into play and then these smaller sharks will actually chase away or give off to the bigger shark so that it can go to the bank first. And you've seen this firsthand as well, mm -hmm. Kelly. Yeah, no, these sorts of interactions, um, the dominance or, or the behaviours that they display when they're interacting with each other is very interesting. And it's it's funny that you sort of mentioned that, that idea because I've seen that exact thing happen um, with a, a larger shark around the boat. And then we had a, a great white come in half the size of that one. And, and we assume that the larger one would have right of way and perhaps the smaller one would back off. But no, the, the little guy went straight for the, the larger great white and, and clamped down on the tail end of the, the bigger shark. And the big shark was gone and the little one got right of way there. So uh, example um, right there of the, the interactions that could actually lead to an injury on our sharks. Very, very interesting to, to see. It's always, always super cool to see, especially when the little guy strikes back. But think about it this way, guys. So you just bought a big bucket of KFC or in the vegetarian, like your case, the vegan case. <laughs> I was veggie for, for a long time, guys. So, mm -hmm. so I have sort of in a way a right to say this, but so you're looking at a big bucket of lettuce and um, your little brother or little sibling wants to take the biggest, nicest, juiciest ever head of lettuce and you just give them a slap on the head and you're like, no, that's mine. And it's basically the same when it comes to these sharks. So they're not physically attacking or eating the other, the other shark that's there. It's just basically a dominance thing where they will bite another shark. So Kelly, this is covering the natural side of um the sharks getting these injuries either from the fur seals or from other sharks etc um but what when we get to the unnatural side obviously those are the mo the more severe injuries that we're looking at so um what could that entail and can you just elaborate a bit on the unnatural injuries that we're getting within these sharks yeah of course so like i mentioned before these would be your anthropogenic 
um, origins. So when I say that, I mean influenced by humans, it's influenced by us. Uh, unfortunately, these are the sort of injuries that we see more often. Um, and like you said, they're the ones that I guess you could say are, are more extensive or intense. Uh, when we're talking about injuries um, through human influence, we're usually talking about things like uh, boat strikes or perhaps disentang oh, pardon me, entanglement um, in discarded uh, waste and, and pollution like plastic or, or, or fishing gear. So, so that's what we would be looking at in, in more of an unnatural sense for, for injuries for these sharks. Okay, cool. Um, and when we're talking about, I mean, you and I have both seen excessive injuries when it comes to either prop cuts or fishing line. Um, so before this healing starts to occur, because obviously we're talking about wound healing in great white sharks now. So before this healing starts to occur, for those of you that follow marine dynamics, have seen some of the stuff that we've done, you guys would know that we've got quite a high success rate in either disentangling these animals or removing that immediate danger from that animal before the healing process occurs. Um, so cutting off fishing line, disentangling from that, even at some severe cases, removing ropes hanging out of their stomach where they've eaten something where a rope is attached and then that rope is hanging um, out of the shark's mouth. So we, we sort of specialize in that. But Kelly, for the sake of the conversation, the sake of where we're heading to. So say for instance, that hazard has been removed from the individual um then healing starts taking place and how does that work and where 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 does it start and how does it take place over a long or short period of time yeah well if you you're talking about injury caused by um entanglement so there is an object that is is restricting the animal um of course it is best to to to, to remove that so that the process healing process can take place and do so um, in the correct um, stages. Um, if, say, that object is um, left on the animal, um, the healing will take place, but not to, to what it should be. And, uh, of course, this is probably going to cause problems further along the line, say, if the animal is, is growing or, or perhaps um, the energy demands that it takes to, to heal or it, it's actually stopping them from going around their, uh, on their usual um, activities like hunting and, and feeding. But if you were to remove that, of course, the process could, could take place. Um, I think we should actually start on the outside of the shark before What's we up, really get... Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <It's just> <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's a friend of mine that's watching. Hey, Anu, nice to, nice to have you guys tuning in. Thank you. Now, um, yeah, let's start actually on the, the outside of the shark, um, the uh, dermal denticles or the, the, the shark skin, um, because I think this is an important component to, to um, uh, speaking about wounds and injuries that, that the sharks actually can sustain. Um, so the, the dermal denticles is, is what you'll describe the, the skin of a, a shark as. It's not like your traditional fish scales. Um, simply put, they're, they're small modified um, teeth with a hardened enamel um, that, that is, um, among other things, providing a, a very good physical barrier um, for these animals to protect against, say, some of those um, not as intense injuries or perhaps helping to, to um, stop the injury from being being too intense. So um, those dermodenticals are, are really, really helping out there in regards to, to uh, those injuries. Yeah, man. And when you're talking about dermal denticles, um, guys, so this is this is quite common in our sense, sense of the work and working with sharks. But for those of you guys who are new, like sharks, um, we might not know as much about them yet. So the dermodenticles, think of dermatologists. So the dermodenticles are basically the shark skin is comprised of thousands and thousands of little teeth. Um, and if you rub it the one way, 
it's smooth, but if you're rubbing it the one way, and I've, I've experienced this when working on shark rescues or basically removing dead animals from an area, it's when you rub it another way, it's like sandpaper. Those, the, their, their skin is basically, is a very tough, they've got an incredibly tough skin. Um, that sandpaper and, <laughs> and it scratches the whole body up. It's incredible, actually, um, once you come in contact with it. So, Kelly, so we were still talking about the stages when it when it comes to, so they've got these dermodenticles as a hard initial layer, but I'm sure you've got quite a few um, things that you want to show us or tell us about the stages and how these sharks are actually healing, what's happening um, when they do sustain an injury and how it starts healing from there. Yeah, so I, I've got a few examples just to, to, to show that. Um, but first on the dermal denticle side of things, for those of you that are interested, uh, we do actually have a blog on our Marine Dynamics website. Um, so we'll just pop that up on the, the screen there. So if you would like to, to have a look at that, um, you will find that on our website under the blogs um, in the category shark facts on page two. So shark armor, what is special about shark skin? So if anyone would shark like to have a look at armor. that, please do. <laughs> That's so cool, shark armor. Yeah, or, but but I love that. <laughs> <laughs> but furthermore, oh, just quickly, shout out to Ono. Thank you for joining Ono. It's Not nice to, to have you. Yeah. Um, I think before we get into some examples, that I'd like to show um, of of the healing process. Uh, just quickly touch on something a little bit deeper than just the the, the physical barrier, and of course that is is um, the genes. Of, of the sharks. Um, so this is, yeah, this is something that has become quite a bit of an interest um, over the last few years, especially in regards to, to interest in our own biomedical um, area. Uh, so by studying the specific genes related to immunity, scientists have actually found that there are some species like the great white shark um, that have more genes dedicated to the function of antibody uh, mediated immunity. Um, so that is to say that antibodies, um, or they have more antibodies that help to fight off infection compared to many other other animals. And that's also believed um, to help quicken the, the the wound healing within these sharks. So it there's a, a number of things that that really contribute to to um, the the ability of these these sharks to to heal well. Um, you know, they're known for their regenerative abilities. Um, they, however, still heal through a, a complex series of, of stages and really the varying degree of um, response depends on the extent of the injury or the degree of the damage. Like you mentioned before, you know, we have seen some very extensive wounds, whereas there's those other injuries that perhaps aren't, aren't so bad. But hopefully the examples we share will will outline that for people. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, just before we share those examples, because I just want to mention something. <laughs> Kelly, I hope you're not angry. <laughs> but firstly, we're talking about how incredibly um, amazingly these sharks are healing. Firstly, sharks don't get corona, for those of you that don't know. <laughs> that we know of yet. I haven't seen them swimming around with face masks just yet um but also guys um even though these animals can sustain and survive and heal from incredible injuries it does not mean that they are going to survive us taking them out of the water cutting off their fins and throwing them back in the water and this is just something i feel truly passionate about in the sense that even though these animals are incredibly adapted to surviving major injuries um kelly is going to show us some examples now is they they don't survive by us cutting off their fins and throwing them back i mean that is not something <laughs> something that anything would survive it's like taking us just cutting off our arms and legs and just putting us 
next next to the road, essentially. No, you're a hundred percent right. Oh, Every damp in the mood. Sorry, Kelly. <laughs> no, no, but yeah, um, you're a hundred percent right. Every species has a, a threshold of which they're going to to actually come back from from wounds or injuries. And whilst our sharks are known to to be able to heal amazingly, there there of course is that level of which it's just not going to happen. And the the finning of the animal, uh, those fins are an important feature of the animal, as we know. Um, but there is no way those guys are going to to grow those fins back anytime soon. So no, you're right. Yeah, man. And Kelly, I I I read somewhere um, a few days ago that on False Bay, um, we didn't previously discuss this. Um, and there's a stat. Um, there's a few stats that I that I've gathered, and something from the EU. It's 360,000 tons of just shark fins getting shipped to China every year, which is ridiculous. But that's an actual fact. It's an actual statistic. Um, we're not going to touch too much on that now. I just thought I'd mention it. But that's just shark fins. 360,000 tons, tons of just the fins are getting so guys while we're talking about the incredible animals and the incredible healing capabilities that they may have we as humans trump that and we all need to honestly focus <laughs> we need to focus on the more conservation side of things and be aware of of what's going on around you I, yeah, I just wanted to mention on, on, on that fact there, you're mentioning the fins. It's not just the fins, but the, 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 the product, the, the meat products from the animal. And, and that's a global thing. Um, you know, it, it, those products are being shipped all over the place. So um, it, it is an issue um, all over the world, really. But uh, I think let's get into our examples. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's jump. Let's jump into the examples, Kelly. I'm sure you've got some cool stuff prepared for us, for us to see how these sharks are healing. But guys, I think it was important to touch on that, because um, obviously we are conservationists. Kelly and I, at the heart of things, are shark conservationists. And even though it is not always necessarily focus on the neg negative we try not to it is necessary to point it out it is you don't just blow over it because um focusing on the positive is crucial but um acknowledging the fact that these things are still going on is just as crucial but let's jump into your <laughs> into your things that you want to show us kelly i'm very excited now, I do have three examples of, of individuals that have been observed in a local area of Khansbai. Um, each have injuries of varying extent and, and suffered under different circumstances. Now, before we get into this, um, I am going to be using um, a video clip and some photos. And because we are talking about wounds and injuries, um, I must mention that there could be some graphic content. Um, so just a warning to those of you that are tuning in, Perhaps if, if this is, is not something you'd like to view, um, now it is probably not the, the time to continue with this, but I, I will be showing um, some of those wounds and injuries. Okay, so just a, a bit of a warning. All good with that? Yeah. Okay, fantastic. I, I wanna see. <laughs> okay, so the, the first example um, I, I'd like to jump into is probably the most extensive wound I'm gonna show today. Um, and this is a, a shark or a great white shark, I should say, by uh, the nickname of Prop. Um, now, this individual was observed injured in the area back in 2008. Um, it was monitored over weeks, months and uh, years, actually. And uh, 2012 Dyer Island Conservation publication came from the monitoring of this wound. Um, authored by Alison Towner, Malcolm Smell, and Oliver Jewell. And that publication can be found on our website and it outlines the whole um, monitoring and, and process that was seen with this individual. So this is prop here that you're seeing. Um, this is footage taken from 2008 and uh, 2009. So you can see the, um, the damage there. 
um, on the, the, the ventral, um, or oh, sorry, the dorsal surface of the animal there, um, or the top of the animal there. And this was believed to be caused by a, a boat. So that's a, a boat strike there. Uh, you can see it's going through the, the skin, the dermal denticles, and right into that muscle tissue there. Um, that's an incredibly that, big scar, Kelly. Wow. Yeah, it, it, it's, I it's, remember it's that. a extensive extensive wound um now he was monitored for the few weeks after um the injury was sustained um and then of course like our white sharks do he left the bay but nine months later he was spotted again in the bay so he did return the crew or team were able to recognize this shark using the extensive um photographic database we have of the dorsal fins and you can see exactly the extent of, of the healing in this animal in nine months. It's absolutely amazing. As you'll see, the, the wound has has closed and you've got that pigmented scar remaining on, on the, the top there. That's incredible, Kelly. I mean, look at those healing mm. capabilities. It is absolutely astounding. I remember we had one shark as well a couple of years ago um, that had prop cuts also from a boat so what was that big word you used anthro and and anthropogenic and, so human anthropogenic, influence yeah. <laughs> anthropogenic and it was cut by this prop and within the three months that it spent in our bay you could see that healing process taking place and it's just absolutely incredible how these guys can sustain in incredibly serious injuries and heal from that i mean marine mammals in general uh, i've seen um with seals and whales also but with the fish as well i've seen like sharks healing from incredible injuries so um kelly what is um we haven't discussed this prior but infection on these wounds these do these animals suffer from infections on a wound like that? I think it's interesting, um, just to go back, that you touched on the, the marine mammal side of things, you know, that comparison between your other marine um, animals to your sharks is quite interesting. And they all have their, their own way of processing or healing from these wounds. And that is something that is discussed in that publication um, that I mentioned before that, that worked around the, the, that shark that we just showed. And, and that publication, um, yeah, Wound Healing in Carcaridon Carcaris, is available on our website there. But it does also draw in the comparison between the different animals and, and really how they heal, which is quite interesting. Um, in regards to, to um, uh, that shark there, you're right as well. You know, that footage we just saw, that was actually taken about or approximately a month after the assumed injury took place so it's already in the healing process you can see that the the the, the muscle tissue there is, is actually um going a lighter color whereas it would have been um you know that ready pinky color when it was originally um sustained um fast forward another eight months after that um that footage and photos that we saw at the end of the clip uh, that shark was seen in in the bay again, and um, again even more so that 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 wound or scar, I should say, is is healing up. Um, but it it does have it does have its negatives as well. You know, yes, they're amazing. This process, um, the way that they're, they're they're healing so quickly, but it it, it does actually affect them because there is high energy demand in in this healing process um it's something that we've spoken about before as well you know whether all that energy goes towards a healing process so you may see um you know a lessening of the health or the body conditioning of the animal or perhaps it's taking them away from from something something else else too but happy to say that that prop um the the, the team concluded um, at the end that there was little evidence of long-term damage uh, in that the animal swam and behaved like it would be assumed with, with this species. Something cool that's stemming from this, guys, though, is something that Kelly and I have noticed, Ruben Rutson. And just before mm. I say that, I've just realized by looking at myself back on the screen that I have a mustache. And I never noticed that. 
before. Um, so welcome, Dicky and his mustache. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, really? I, I never knew it was this prominent on my face before, <laughs> before this I, live I, thing. But, I, I okay. didn't know that was a that was a, a new thing. To be honest, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's new to me. Okay. Cool. <laughs> anyway, um, what what did I want to say? So Kelly, I wanted to touch on something, which is um, the fact when we're looking at the healing of these these animals, and I don't remember what it was at all. <laughs> That's fine. Do you want? Do you want to um, get on to uh, you example? Can to the next example until yeah. I remember. I was going to say <laughs> we'll, we'll go with, the, I really we'll go with example too. <laughs> you might remember. Um, yeah, so, example two, unfortunately, like prop is um, an example of a, a shark that has sustained an injury um, through human influence. So this is lucky. Uh, a shark uh, very close to the Marine Dynamics team members that were involved in her disentanglement, of which you can all watch as it was recorded and is available for viewing on our YouTube channel. Now you can see from the photo um, that Lucky had encountered what too, too many animals do these days. Um, this small female measuring in at the time at approximately 2.8 metres in length was observed in 2013 to be entangled in fishing line. So completely encasing the trunk uh, on the level with the fifth gill section, an infliction with if, uh, an infliction which, if left, um, can cause a number of problems and possibly kill the animal. But it's also an injury which we can intervene and try to help. Of course, it is last resort um, to try to hook the animal, but with a case like this and with permission granted. Um, to do so, this course of action seemed the, the only possible way to save her. Um, so, do you probably remember this shark? Um, we yeah, still see yeah, her moving through the bay. And I want to add something on this, if you don't mind. Um, guys, when it comes to the entangling of animals, I'm not saying there's better and worse, but smaller animals like the shark or younger seals younger whales even they are growing at an exponential rate like humans would grow so getting disentangled at a younger age is incredibly hectic in the sense that sorry for the graphicness of this but these animals are dying slowly it's it's a horrible dip. Like, look at this animal. So when it first got wrapped by this fishing line, um, the fishing line was around was okay. But as it's growing, this fishing line is shrinking in around this animal, and it happens to seals, it happens to whales, it happens to sharks, it happens to anything. Um, it's growing into this, so it's just a case of being even more aware. Like, this is not. I'm not saying any death of an animal is good, but when you're looking at the slow, later on they can't feed, they can't move, they can't breathe. And um, so the younger animals, as the shark, so I'm incredibly happy. You can see how it cut in, how, how the shark has grown from this. Um, but what I wanted to say, Kelly, Kelly, I actually remembered what I wanted to say, is something very interesting that we've learned from sharks getting hurt or sharks getting damaged. And this, um, I've not seen it in, in any scientific papers yet. You might agree or disagree, Kelly. This is a personal opinion from my side. But what I have seen from individuals with either missing pectorals or a damaged dorsal fin or both is that they adapt their hunting behavior because they are now not as streamlined, not as naturally adapted to hunting. They're not as smooth in the water. And we've got a shark that you and I mentioned in a previous chat called Bullet. Um, some call it Big Nemo. There are various sharks. Um, that have natural um, disasters, <laughs> natural disasters, not the word, but how they can 
which is incredible how they can, because of this, um, dragging them behind because of a damaged dorsal or pectoral or missing limb or whatever, they can actually adapt their hunting style to be more full on because of this. Um, so I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm just saying it's something that we have noticed from from animals recovering from severe injuries is that they actually have to adapt the style in which they approach prey, which is an incredibly cool observation to make. It's, it's not necessarily scientific. It's not necessarily um, something that's good or bad. It is just an observation that I have seen from working with sharks over an extended period of time. Which, which was cool for me to notice. No, I think we have to remember that these sharks, that they're very robust, uh, they're very resilient. And like you mentioned, they're, they're going to adapt to, to, to what, what is, is, is coming their way really. So no, very much so. Um, but I think we can actually see what happens to uh, Lucky here now. So I have, um, I do have, a picture wow. of her wow. not even yeah not even 12 months later so like i mentioned she was successfully disentangled wow. so the team was able to to take that fishing line off her um if you would like to watch that video is like that we mentioned it is, on YouTube. Really? It, it is isn't it so within 12 months this animal uh you can see the wound has healed over and we're left with um so sorry can we um, go back sorry Corey is our social media manager guys um <laughs> sorry, can we go back to the original photo quickly and then just skip through to this one again if you don't mind um she organizes our stuff guys um but mm. look at that look at that wound and then we're taking it back to the next photo again that is incredible and kelly what time frame did you say this was that was that was actually less than 12 months that is incredible. So within a year. Oh. Hmm. No, and we, we still we still saw this shark. Um, I believe our last encounter with Lucky was back in 2016. And it's very hard to actually see that scar now. Um, you know, we really do have to go back to that dorsal fenugate. It is lucky because that, that has healed even more so. Um, to the point where it's not as darkly pigmented as what you see in that photo. So amazing, That's absolutely incredible. amazing. That yeah. is incredible. Mm. Now I do have one last example. This is actually one that I put in because those two examples we just looked at um, really are injuries influenced by um, uh, anthropogenic um, uh, causes so uh, human influence this one here um looks like it, it's more of a a, a natural occurrence um oh. and, and yeah doesn't look so nice this is a uh, scarlet so a more recent recent example here uh, she's been known to the team since 2014 but was observed in 2015 when she visited the bay um to have multiple injuries on her head and as you can see there, the tip of the, the caudal fin or the tail is actually hanging on there. Um, now, this appears to have been inflicted by another shark. Um, very much looks like bite wounds. Um, so whilst it covers a large area, the, the wounds, uh, they don't appear to, to be too deep bar what's happening there with the, the caudal fin. Um, so this is an example of the, the sort of injuries that the sharks can inflict on themselves. I could not tell you um, exactly what led to these um, uh, interactions between, between Scarlet and, and whichever shark did, did um, take a disliking to her. But we do have a picture of her just a month later. Um, so she stayed within the vicinity of the oh. area. Um, and she was spotted um, not even a, a month later, really. Um, and you can see the, the bite wounds on her head are healing nicely. The wounds are closing over. You've got the darkly pigmented scarring coming through. Um, those dermal denticles that we spoke about before, the shark skin, um, the placoid scales there, they, they do actually replace. So with these wounds, um, healing comes new, new dermal denticles um, to offer protection yet again over that site. Um, ten months after the 
10 months after the original um, sighting and wounds were logged, um, we had her revisit the bay again. So you guys can see um, from this next set of photos uh, exactly how well Scarlett is, is doing. Oh, just there we go. Okay, beautiful, man. Yeah. Champ, what? You can't, own, <laughs> you almost can't even see the scoring at the top of a body. That is incredible. That's yeah, so this, like I said, this was this was ten minute, uh, ten months after after ten the original. Um, yeah, <laughs> that would be something. Sorry, um, ten months after the original sighting and the wounds were logged. So you can see that the the wounds, the injury on her head there, really has healed healed nicely. Again, very similar to to fishing, um, the the fishing line entanglement with Lucky. Um, cats, to this, sharks are super fish. Sorry. Thank <laughs> Sorry. You, <laughs> well, that's why. Thanks, Tasha, for joining us again. Yes, um, yeah. Sharks are super fish. Now, you know, if, if we were to see these sharks um, now, you know, Scarlet was seen around the same time as Lucky, and it, it's really hard to, to pick up on the, the, the scarring out there. Um, even more impressive, um, that, that caudal fin, the tail, you can see that the tip that was hanging on um, has fallen off. Uh, but you can see that the wound, that surface, exposed surface um, or tissue area there, um, has healed over and it appears as if the dermal denticles have been replaced as well. So just a, a, another example of, of just how how um, well or, or the ability that these animals have to, to heal from, from these injuries. Yeah, incredible. Mm. So... Kelly, I think we've covered a lot about show and dude, I could just talk to you all day. You're amazing. <laughs> like I could just pick your brain all day. But for that, you guys are gonna have to tune into next chat with Kelly and I on Sign Save mm -hmm. Sharks. So Kelly, I cannot wait to chat to you again. In fact, after this stream, I'm gonna call you just to <laughs> just <laughs> Chat about sharks, but guys, we will be having a Q and A session this Friday at six o'clock again. And Kelly and I will be answering any of your questions. You guys can ask us questions on any of our platforms, whether it be Instagram, Facebook, um, or YouTube. YouTube. Save sharks. Let us know what your questions are. It would be really cool to chat to you guys. Let us know what the questions are, Kelly. It's been an absolute pleasure always so nice to speak to you and guys thank you very much for tuning in we really hope you guys are learning something please give us feedback on these shows we'd love some input um moses our friend just gave us a, a, a feedback on a new intro that we could have that could be very cool so we want to make it interactive we want to make it good for you guys so please let us know follow our marine dynamics youtube channel um go visit our facebook visit our instagram and then again once again if you guys have any questions please let us know mm -hmm. we are here so kelly you're the bomb diggity diesel thank you very much i've learned a lot this evening guys oh plastic free july mm -hmm. you on that kelly yeah, I think um, hitting on the, the, the discarded um, rubbish and the fishing line and plastics, etc. Perfect day for that uh, because today is the first day of Plastic Free July. So I think everyone should just keep that in their mind. Um, why keep it to a month? Why not try to, to uh, do that throughout the entire year? And so, yeah, man. Stop them plastics. I've even got <laughs> one of those dispo uh, not disposable, actually the opposite. Those reusable straws now. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I use a reusable straw, and that is if I use a straw, that's the straw I'm using. Guys, straws, even those little things. Remember, Kelly, we spoke earlier. Guys, when it comes to plastic, um, what I've seen a lot before we end this broadcast is what I've seen a lot is even the littlest, littlest things, those things that you rip around the milk carton, that that little thing that goes that you rip around the milk cartons. I found several penguins with that stuck in their mouth before. So even something little that you don't think, those are actually some of the things making the biggest impact 
on the Marine Society. So if you guys want to donate, if you guys want to help us with our research or conservation projects, please go check out www.dict.org.za. It is at the bottom of the screen there. And join us again next time. Friday, Q&A, boom, call in. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you for being behind the scenes and sorting us out. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, mute.